on the program is an ardent economics and a public affairs analyst, Mr. Adefolarin Olamileko. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Bito, and good morning to all of you, Asadi. Nice to be here once again every Tuesday. All right, now, let's get straight into it now. Mm. Following the floods in Meduguri, the mm. president was out on an international trip mm. whilst the vice president, Senator Kashim Shetima, earlier visited. Mm. But now, the president, in his magnanimity, has also postponed his trip to the United States of America in order to be able to dialogue with the victims and empathize with them, more so the setting up of a strategic ecological fund at this point hmm. to ensure that all resources on ground cater to the needs of most persons over a million affected across communities and some now situated in IDP camps. Hmm. Uh, let's get your thoughts on this. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting and uh, we appreciate the president for visiting for visiting uh, Bono at this point in time, particularly to show concern and to show empathy for the people who are affected by the uh, flood. But one thing that I take out of the message or out of the visit is what the show of uh, Bono is talking about, that the flood needs to be proved. If you remember on this platform, I said there are conspiracy theories around why I could allow them, allow them break at this point in time. We have had series of a uh, 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 flood and Bidugui was never flooded. And that was the major controversy. Mm. Whilst we saw reports by the federal government that uh, the dam did not necessarily collapse. Exactly. There were also reports that this fault had been noticed over nine years ago. Mm. And at that time it was noticed, the amount budgeted for well, the, what I call it, refurbishment mm -hmm. was $26 million. Mm. Now, it will take eight years mm. and over 146 million naira mm. to begin those repairs of the dams. Mm. Uh, people are now saying it is climate change issues, mm. that the rains have been more severe as to why the, mm. the, uh, the, the communities in Meduguri were affected other than the dam. That controversy mm. continues to remain one that has not really been dispelled. Mm. And uh, whilst the Shehu of Borno is calling for a probe, mm -hmm. do you think that he is outrightly pointing back to the Alao Dam? Definitely, that's what he did. And that's what some of us have already this need to be proved. As I speak right now, Lake Chad is shrinking. As it will shrink, Lake Chad is dry. How come such flood did not go? How such such heavy water did not flow to that aspect? How come it is the Medjugorje city that this flood came? All that local government, all that areas of Medjugorje did not record the, 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 the flood. So how come? Even though the closeness of the dam may be to Medjugorje, but what we are saying is that over the years, we have had serious flood that would have consider Medjugorje to be a flooded city. And we never had it. The 2022 flood, it never happened there. The 2020, 2020, 2012 flood, and the one that was so severe, the entire Nigeria was underwater. That was the 2012. It was not flooded. So how come this one? And if the show of Medjugorje is saying that it needs to be proved, that means he know more about what has really happened. Because to him, if the what if the dam has been overflowed, it's supposed, it's supposed not to flow into Medjugorje city. How come it flow into the Medjugorje city and it overtake the entire city and look at it again, it overtook the entire, the poor areas where poor people are staying. Also affected, amongst the affected areas is the correctional center where mm -hmm. over 286 inmates escaped. Exactly. And so far, the correctional service has said that 17 of them have been recaptured. Exactly. A lot of them, Boko Haram members who mm. were incarcerated are mm. still at large. Mm. Is this also a growing security concern? It is, but I know they will recover most of them. They will get them back and they uh, the, the, the fear around that particular escape of uh, prison prisoners or people that have inmates is quite alarming, but we know that they will recover them back. But back to the main issue of that allow them. Even the, the excuses that everybody is giving that the dam need to be recovered, the dam need to be refurbished, it's just, in many of us are trying as much as to, to look into the critical aspect of it, judging by the historical incidents of flooding in Ligurie, I've, I've not yet convinced whether it is the dam that, 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 that collapsed or someone is trying to pull a string somewhere. And that is why the Shewa Medugu is saying it needs to be proved. But away from that, we also need that the people need so-called. The government has promised a lot of so-called for the people and I wish the money and whatever material they are giving to them will get to the right people at the same time. But you also remember what the vice president said. He said most areas that the floor started from, that that's the area that have been considered a flood prone area. And he has advised during his tenure as president that people should not build on that particular area. But all of a sudden, as he came to interview to come and visit them, he saw that those places have been houses have sprinkled up and he was surprised. So it means that something is happening that officially 
government have been negligent, either federal government or, uh, or the state government have been negligent in terms of how urban renewal is being construed or constructed across the country. And it's not just Medugumi that we're having these challenges. There are flood prone areas that government are giving allocation for people to go and build house, go and build estates. And you know that these areas are not meant to be for, for building. But as it happened in Medugumi right now, we don't know the next state that is going to suffer another heavy flood. Even though Kirby State have suffered its own share of the flooding, and that's why I see that uh, 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 Bonu State is suffering. So we don't know the next state that will suffer heavy flooding like this. But you know, it, this is the month that the flooding normally comes. The moment it gets to 25th, 27th, we won't be causing any flooding issue again, in a part, a particularly in the northern part of the country. And by ending of September, nobody talk about flooding again. But this is the month that flooding normally takes place in Nigeria, and everybody needs to be alert. Now, the Nigerian Meteorological Agency, mm. NIMET, has also issued a prediction that starting today, Tuesday, mm. for the next three days, mm. there's going to be severe thunderstorms mm. and rains. Mm. Uh, talk us through what this means in mm. terms of the federal government's pledge to tackle issues of the ecology and environment differently mm. with the setting up of an ecological fund. <laughs> Most of us that talk about ecological fund have discovered that it's just a cesspool of corruption. State governors and federal government have not been able to understand and utilize that money, I suspect. And particularly the state governors, because it is a money that constitutionally is recognized to be given to the state governors, but most of them, they believe that uh, nothing will happen. But something has been happening. I can remember in 2008, 2009, there was a study that participated that talked about ecological fund, and they tried as well to understand why state governors are not putting effort to utilize that money to the level that it's expected. But guess what? It became a political thing. The state governor thought that it was is a witch hunt against the ruling uh, from the ruling party against them, and it was recovered uh, recorded that a lot of those money went into political act activities as well as to into private pocket, and that's what we are seeing experiencing today. People are not even talking much about ecological fund again because many people are tired of it. No governor is responding. If you ask them the question, they will tell you different stories, and the federal government also doesn't want to push for it that we want transparency in use of ecological fund, and now. The media have taken it over again and saying ecological fund has been wasteful and we have to be regarded as the most painful activities of governors, particularly governors. Even though federal government have been so quiet, the office of ecological fund have been reading with uh, corruption. A lot of people who serve in that office have been questioned by EFCC over the years and nothing comes up with it. But what we are trying to say right now is that in as much as this money has been given to state governors, we expect them to use that money particularly for correcting some infrastructural gap. Because what that money is meant for to correct infrastructure gap that will take care of every flooding or every water after rainfall. But most of them don't use it. So they divide the money to other essence because they lack money. Because they have used the real money that they are generating from fact for other things and they are in debt. Because we must also understand why state governors normally divert funds meant for a particular critical infrastructure of their state. Because they are in debt, they will use that money for something. And because there is no monitoring, no follow up, and it, whoever is doing a uh, monitoring ecological fund uh, uh, doesn't have that power because it's just a unit under the presidency uh, which can be turned into a commission that will have more power to punish, to sanction and to ask for transparency around it definitely some state government will sit right and use the money as expected now let's look at uh, two more papers that talk about some of the infrastructures that uh, have been abandoned in some states and with the worsening rains like we highlighted two infographics as captured on the leadership newspaper and the daily trust now on the leadership it mentioned roads across mm. sections of the country worthy of note talking about the abuja kaduna road the umwahia ikotekmene road kalabai to highway adoekiti ikare akure road makudi enugu roads which are now considered a dead trap now sections of the kalaba itu road are pictured there at the bottom left hand corner it also has sections of the abuja kaduna road and the bida mina road which have collapsed now on the daily trust you look at the 40 billion naira ecological fund and the fact that between june and december 2023 25.07 billion naira was disbursed between january to may 2024 that is this year another 15.42 billion naira has been disbursed in total, 40.50 billion naira. Now, in this largesse, you'd find in the northwest part of the country, 10.53 billion naira, which was disbursed to the governors in the northwest region. 
In the northeast, 8.09 billion. The north central received 4.7 billion naira. The southwest, 7.77 billion naira. The southeast, 5.88 billion naira. And the south, south 3.45 billion naira. Now, this infographics is compiled by Haruna Ibrahim of the Daily Trust with infographics credit given to Ali A. Yadam. Now, this is quite the amount on mm. paper. Mm. Now, despite those amounts, you see more than five roads making interstate travel become even more cumbersome exactly. for transporters and mm. commuters who continue to grow on. Mm. Not to even talk about the level of road carnage exactly. and fatalities recorded owing to such roads. There's mm. a downtime in being able to transport both goods and services mm. and persons mm. across the states. Exactly. But what we, what we also need to quickly point out that the money in question, the ecological money in question, is for state to address state roads, particularly state roads. We have to correct that. It's not meant to correct federal roads. But you can discover that most of the state roads are linking up with the federal roads. Right. So for federal roads not to be damaged or not to be destroyed on time, that's why it is expected that it, those state roads need to be maintained. But you can see that between 2023 and 2024, 40 billion have been disbursed. Uh, you know, in the past, billions upon billions have been disbursed, and none of those state governments can really give account. And that's why most of us are calling that that office needs to be rearranged, needs to be restructured. I think the Blueprint did a particular uh, feature on that particular uh, ecological fund, which I also participated as one of the experts that spoke on. And he said, ecological fund needs to be moved beyond just an office or just an, a department. That is headed by just a, a, a coordinator. It has to go into serial legal framework to ensure that it has the power to be able to function. And we also suggest at that point in time that they don't need to be giving the governors the money again. Let them look at the project they need to tackle with that money and address those issues. Because over, as a daily trust have pointed out, all the money that been given from eight billion to ten billion to five billion to three billion to six billion, all now if you ask the governors where is the money, they can't give a damn account of that money. They are using it for something else. And that's the challenge that we have found ourselves. But we are saying right now that it needs to be corrected. And correcting it means that we need to take ecological fund office to National Assembly and say how we can have a legal framework to make it more structure-wise, more serious, and more officially dedicated to the job that is meant to do. Just like fiscal, uh, fiscal commission and the rest of those commissions that also have a, an input at the state level. Because this one has an input at the state level and it will go a long way to efforts to address some of the infrastructure gap and infrastructure that many you have particularly road infrastructure. And not to forget, also affected houses. Ecological issues affect houses, residential area, and the rest of them. To build coverage, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, areas where water can flow easily. Those are the things that the money is meant for. Then again, to the roads that have been said to be affected, cut off either in Calabar, in Cardona, we know that during the rainy season, it's very difficult to construct road. And we must understand that one. But there are some roads that federal government have not, particularly the Calabar own, People have been talking about Calabar Road that the government have not touched. Federal Road in Calabar, that means cross river state. So federal government need to take a look. Ministry of uh, Works and Housing need to take a look at that particular environment and see what they can do. The Kaduna, I mean Abuja, Kogi, Bini Road is also very bad. We know that it's under construction right now. The Abuja Kaduna Road is under construction. But majority of the roads that are failing are state roads. And we must call the governors to action. Because most of the major federal roads are under construction. And the contractor also appealed that because of the rainy season, they cannot do much. Even when they do one or two things, before you know when the rain comes, it wash it away. But we also need to speak out and call on FEMA. The Kefi Abuja Road, there are about 82 sections that are filled with potholes, large potholes, that's more than 10 meters on the Abuja Kefi Road. That's the road I applied anytime I'm coming to, Ab to Abuja. 82 portions. Or 82 sections are very, very bad. And NEMA have been doing some palliative that are not palliative at all. Just two Sundays ago, I saw the, the chairman of local, of local government doing palliative on the road between a uh, massacre and local government. It was doing palliative. And there's a, 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 a one of the deadliest sections on that road opposing Nipco filling station at Nunyanya. A very deep, big ditch is there where vehicle can, can swallow vehicle. So FEMA need to come in. The one they are doing at our bachelor road, this is more like advocacy for them. The one they are doing at bachelor road, they are just poorly wasting resources. That we have told them what to do before. There is no drainage around that area. All the drainage has been blocked with sand. So they need to evacuate those sand and make a proper drainage. 
but they are not doing it. So 82 section on the Abuja Kepi road is very bad. And FEMA has been doing a poorly job in terms of palliative. So we have to call them out. Now, now let's bring in a concept that the mm -hmm. Minister of Works, Engineer David Mwaki, had introduced following his appointment by President Bola Metimibu mm -hmm. sometime last year. Mm -hmm. he, he talked about the need to change the way we approach road constructions for mm -hmm. durability, especially in times of persistent rain. Mm -hmm. He talked about a move to concrete roads, mm -hmm. away from the asphalt tarmacs that mm -hmm. we are used to. Mm -hmm. But it almost feels as though the implementation of such a policy mm -hmm has not been carried down by states in terms of the trunk A, trunk B roads mm -hmm. dichotomy and the mm -hmm. responsibility of either the state governor or the federal government. See, for me, Bito, the problem of our road is not whether we are going for concrete or we are going for asphalt. The problem is drainage system. So the to start with the construction of not having dual drain drainage systems is the major issue. It's the problem. And the drainage system needs to be connected to a canal or a channel that will take out all the waters. Then the third problem is poor maintenance culture and abuse of road by Nigerians. But, but another point he was trying to make is the fact that for concrete roads, mm -hmm. in terms of the porosity of mm -hmm. the grains used in making the road, mm -hmm. it will allow for the water, with or without a proper drainage system, mm -hmm. to somewhere find its way out of the road, mm -hmm. not like when the asphalt road retains water on the tarmac, despite the rains having stopped. But the, 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 the asphalt dried faster than the than the, the concrete. concrete because the concrete will soak the water and when you soak the water for a very long time what will happen to do the major problem is drainage then the, the second problem is channeling the drainage system into a, a canal, bigger canal a bigger canal then the third problem is the maintenance of the road by our people yesterday when the rain was falling yesterday i saw some people pouring debris into the to the into the rain so that the water will flow and take it up. And where is what is this borders on indiscriminate disposal of waste? Definitely an abuse of those things. Now, when you when do, when the flood water of that will take it to a particular and block, then there are a lot of sand. Another problem we normally have is that you know when they when they finish constructing road, the other shoulders of the road of the of the roads will be asphalt. Then the other part of it will be left maybe in front of a of a of a, a resident building that has mold. Now, when rain comes, rain will pull those mood into the drainage, then block it. Then other water that's coming will now overflow that area. The more mood will come, then block the road. Then before you know it, the shoulder of the road will start peeling off, will start giving way. Then before you know it, the main road will start also... Even the pedestrian walkway... Everything left, will start that because, because there was no proper channeling of the water. I'm giving you from the experience of what I've done with my colleague at Poleco Analytics on this Abuja Kefi road. Then down to the Abuja Kaduna and down to Abuja local Road. This is the same problem we're having. Then before you know it, a little hole in the middle of the of an asphalt road, either concrete or asphalt. The moment that little hole and water continues to be stay on it, then the vehicle are passing. Then before you know it, that particular little hole will begin to manifest, growing big, big, big. Before you know, it, you expand into a ditch, and that's what will happen. And FEMA that's supposed to come and do the maintenance will come and do a shoddy job. They will do a shoddy job and just do a small palliative. They come back again, they do a small palliative. And it has become like an entrepreneurship in the sense that every year we'll come and do a, a budget allocation for this particular road. They'll collect the money, we'll pay people. Th that's how it has become. So they are not maintaining anything. They're just creating opportunity for people to come, to come and milk the government and waste resources. In December of 2023, they put a big signboard on this Abuja case where they say they are doing major repairs, major maintenance. They didn't do anything. I personally monitor. I even asked the workers on it. I said, what are you guys doing here? The problem of this road is drainage. Put drainage, work on the drainage, and channel the water to a bigger uh, uh, canal or whatever. They say it's not their own job to do that. That uh, They only ask them to come out because they are hired labor to come and do the filling. Right now, as I'm speaking, their equipment is on the road saying they want to do maintenance. So we need to call out FEMA. Now, FEMA has to be doing a poorly maintenance job. The palliative they have been doing is just a waste of resources. So government need to look at what FEMA is doing on the Abuja Kefi Road and across the federation because I'm just giving an example of the one I monitor every day, even this morning I still check on some of these roads. The same problem is still there. The maintenance they came to do in Massacre last week Thursday, those uh, uh, gravel they pour on the road have disappeared because rain have come and washed it away. They didn't maintain it very well. So we need to call them out that FEMA is doing a poorly palliative job of road maintenance in Nigeria, across Nigeria. 
a bigger example for them is to come and check the 82 sales section on the Abuja Kefi Road and over 158 section on the Abuja Kefi Road that they say Abuja uh, 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 local jail they say they are doing maintenance. So we need to call them out. Now, Mr. Defolarin, using case studies as regards the Abuja Kefi Road and Abuja Lokoja Road, where he has cited a number of failed sections on the road, has urged the federal government to approach issues of the environment differently while commending the efforts of President Bola Metinibu in setting up an ecological fund. He has also called for a probe of how states have used the money, citing the difficulty in interstate travel with major roads linking states causing commuters and transporters to lament it is indeed off the back of nimet's advisory and alerts that for the next three days there'll be more severe floods and heavy rains accompanied with thunderstorms now unrelated to the state of the road following the increase of heavy downpour is a tragic situation in kaduna yesterday following the celebration of the Eid el malud we're told by some publications this morning that in a road casualty, over 35 persons have lost their lives, particularly to include 15 children. Now, whilst the spirits of celebrations can be high at times, it is also on our road use culture, mm. which has continued to draw concerns from well many Nigerians. Mm. Uh, Mr. Adefolari, mm. let's get your thoughts on this while we also sympathize with the families who have lost loved ones. Uh, we just have to do that. We have to sympathize with them. We also pray that Almighty child will receive the souls of the people that are have left us in this uh, mother health. But it also called for caution. I witnessed the celebration in between Yaya, Maba, Kefi. And also the way the celebrants were actually celebrating, although some of them abused the road, which they were quickly caught to order. You know, they were using both sides of the road, driving, some are driving against the traffic, some are blocking the traffic. You know, we, they were caught to order and, and they begin to quickly arrange it. So because they caused a lot of traffic on that, Abuja, Kefi Road, particularly down to Kefi, they caused a lot of traffic between Maraba and Kefi. And, uh, you know, the, the incident would have occurred as a result of overspeeding, would have also been caused as a result of the poor uh, nature of the road, because there are a lot of ditches all across Af either from A or from B road, there are a lot of ditches on those roads, because as a result of most of these asphalt, concrete, whatever, have, have been washed away as a result of heavy rainfall and water. But the, the, the message still remains that we need to do our celebration in a modest way because it, it, it's expected that we should follow due course to do that celebration. But we, 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 at the end, we have lost people because of our excitement, of our anxiousness has also caused this particular tragedy. But we just pray that all my child are assembled their soul and the family of those who have lost their world of ones can have the empathy, the, the, the strength to be able to absorb the challenge that, that comes with it. Uh, much like the reported mm. road accident mm. is also the issue of boat mishaps. Mm. We're also told that in Zamfara this morning, a certain number of persons have also remained unaccounted for mm. following the boat mishaps. Mm. And on the part of regulation, mm. the agency is saddled with the safety of travelers on the road, the FRSC, mm -hmm. and then on the water inland waterways as well, th their challenges in being able to enforce the guidelines for safety. Mm. Most think, Nigerians mm -hmm. without seat belts on mm -hmm. the roads, mm -hmm. most Nigerians without life jackets on the waterways. Mm -hmm. How do we engage Nigerians on the need for proper safety culture? I think that has been done over time. The only thing that the message may not be sink into the heart of people. And uh, because of the exigency of that period that those people were engaging in their going here and there, uh, carrying out activities, like the one that happened over because of celebration on the, the Molud. It could be an over excitement. Maybe the driver, the passenger. If you see the way they, some of them hang on the vehicle that doing the celebration. Uh, but for the water uh, uh, tragedy, I think it's design time we begin to warn both of At this point in time, because of the flooding, our water level tide is very high. All the rivers, tributary rivers within the Nigerian territory are very high. All the rivers are absorbing a lot of flood water at this point in time. I, I, when I was coming, I saw the UK River, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the Luvu River. These are rivers that were very dry two, three months ago. But right now, they are at the full capacity, even including the New Cairo Bridge. These are, they are, they are smaller rivers, so, but they are not, but at this point in time, they are very flooded with water. And because of what, a lot of flooding water is passing through several tributary 
corners, rivers across Nigeria. So both operators need to be very careful. Even residents around those areas also need to be very careful. That's why you see that flash flow will just become a heavy flood within a time because those dry rivers are now absorbing a lot of water because of the flood. So our message is that both operators, new and Nigerian land, inland waterway authorities also need to begin to conscientize people. I saw them the other day in Lokoja trying to conscientize and uh, give education to both operators. They need to go around the entire country. I don't know how, how, how their capacity is, but that's the message they need to do. And the road safety have been doing their best in terms of road, but we know that most of our drivers are very, very, uh, they, are, they, are, they have their own mindset. This morning as I was coming uh, from Kefi, they are already planning up the opposite direction, driving against traffic because they want to beat the old dub that is on the way. And the old dub is caused as a result of the bad portion of the 82 portion uh, section on the Kabuja Kefi road that is very bad. So we must caution our drivers, we must also advise them, wherever you are going, wake up and leave early. So that you not be driving against traffic and cause onto that ship on other passengers or other passerby or other uh, people using the road as you also well we're going to discuss some of the other issues in the news this morning and whilst we have our main discussion at nine to look at the nnpcl versus dangote refinery and price pegging templates issues it is important to state that the national bureau of statistics this morning greater most papers have published the inflationary rates for the month of August 2024. And quite surprisingly, the statistics are as against the weakening NARA and the hiking PMS. It's pegged at 32.15%. Now, mm -hmm. from the economic perspective, <laughs> that's, that's, a lot of persons mm -hmm. all through the year, mm -hmm. up until now, mm -hmm. for every statistic that's published by the NBS, mm -hmm. have put huge question marks on it or into the cost of living crisis in the country mm. and uh, what households continue to lament with spending over 90% mm. of income mm. on food. The Guardian earlier on listed a number of food items, gave us a beautiful infographics vis-a-vis mm. -vis the inflationary rates. Mm. Do you think that our inflation outlook is evident of our current situation? We have to look at it from the two perspectives. It is official that it's 32.15% from the 30. 33.40% of last month of, uh, of of the month of July to the one of August. The one that we just saw is the month of August, and the one before was uh, July. Now, what MBS is doing to showcase what they have been able to gather with their over 12,000 informants that they send into the market space to go and find out the price of goods and services, about 12,000 of them, over 750 items are, are, are calculated, and uh, the results are put together to, to what we have as inflation. Now, the other side of it is that the real inflation does not reflect the figures that the government will give to us because the market changes, the price changes per second per second. The time that the informant of the NBS will go to the market will be quite different from the time that other Nigerians will go to the market. If you understand. So the time the figures they will get officially will be quite different from the figures we are going to get. Maybe the informant of NBS go to the market early in the morning till afternoon. Then the rest of us go to the market from the afternoon to the evening. So the price change. And we have noticed that in Nigerian palace today, every price of goods change per seconds per second. Depending on how the traders in that particular locality, how they communicate with each other. Because what they do now is to communicate with themselves. Either in Kaduna, Kano, Lagos, what is the price in Kaduna? What is the, that's what they are using now. So the price dictation of what is happening in territorial environment is what determine how much anybody want to say well, whilst, whilst a lot of persons mm. will agree with this school of mm. thoughts let, let's speak some of these items and mm. look at them in terms of the price across locations mm. according to this publication on the guardian mm. the average price for a loaf of bread that a family can afford to have for mm. breakfast mm. is now at 1800 exactly mm -hmm. i don't know if it would be in the fct alone in mm. lagos or in Sokoto, or in Meduguri, or mm. even in the creeks of the Niger Delta. Mm. But it is quite alarming mm. that this same loaf, at the start of the year, mm -hmm. was at 900 Naira. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point when this loaf was 900 Naira, inflation, there are about 24%. Correct. Now, if we do the mathematics, the arithmetics, we all know mm. that at this 32.15%, mm -hmm. does not justify this 1,800 Naira. Definitely. And you, one other thing you need to, there are three things to consider in one, one, the quality of the bread, because they are bread made by master bakers and they are bread made by just ordinary bakery. Now, they could have used an ordinary bakery bread price for us. 
There are still bread that you can get for 1,600 that family can consume, 1,500 for. What is the quality of that bread? That's the first question you ask yourself. Then, second, location matters. In Lagos, for instance, there are several master bakers bread, there are several bread bakery in Lagos. In Abuja, the same thing, but they differ. In Asara, the same thing, they differ. So the quality of the bread, the, the quality of bread that we consume in Abuja are different from the quality of bread some people consume in Asara State. Also different from the quality of bread that consumed in Benue State. For instance, that 1,800 naira bread in the guardians have used in this publication could be the highest in Benue, could be the highest in Plateau. But in other choice cities like Portaco, Lagos, Abuja, is different. There are loads of 2,005, there are loads of 3,000 naira. Depending on location and the quality of the loaf, and that's what matters in this part, particular reference to what we are talking about. But what I'm trying to point out earlier is that for other food commodity, particularly grains, rice, gari, beans, millet, or the rest of it, the price is dictated by communication by the traders. Now, take for instance the example also as against a bag of rice at 95,000 naira, like we have on the infographics this morning. Definitely, that rice they are putting at 95,000 is one of those foreign rice. Local rice, as of Friday, if local rice mudu, IS was 1,900 naira. But if foreign rice mudu was about 2,005, 2,003, 2,004, depending. And local rice also have different grades. The grade I mentioned was one of the this list of the grade of 1,000 naira that you have literally little sharp to pick out but the ones that are all that one around 2100 naira that 2002 the foreign rice 2007 2000 depending on the quality then the choice of that rice or where they are going to but also depend on the location of the market a 95,000 naira bag of rice now you can get it in bigger supermarket if you go to massacre now if you are looking for foreign rice it's very difficult for you what they will bring out for you is majorly nigerian rice but we find one but if you want to get foreign rice they may even tell you they don't have because most local market now they deal majorly on Nigerian rice and they are very expensive. You get it? So location matters, then the quantity and the quality also matter. And now we're also having problem with the baggaging of those rice. They are not up to the 50 kg that have been there are sharp practices in the market. Exactly. Because they are bagging some of those and they are also mixing it up. Now, now this price gouging and mm. sharp practices, mm. many Nigerians were elated when the FCCPC came in and said there will be market visits both in the informal sector mm. markets the open markets mm. and the formal market spaces as well but the challenge is with being able to enforce this price control mm. to stop sharp practices i i, I it, so, it so happened that last week last week we came publication on one of the feature story on blueprint that participating as expert to discuss and i said fccpc is just a, a a toothless bulldog they can't do much and that's what we suggested in that uh, publication that the need to be a review of the law that, that brought up the 2018 act that turned consumer protection board into FCCP need to be reviewed again because they need stronger law. But what they are doing right now is to engage. I think the new uh, executive, executive vice chairman, Tunji, Be Tunji Belo, just did a, a town hall meeting with some traders in Abuja and he says it's going around the country to go and this. They will just be engaging. And those marketers, those traders, they, 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 are not uni they are not unified. You may end up talking to some few people. There will be other sub group in the market that doesn't want to take uh, uh, excuses from anybody. The onion seller, they have their group. The pepper seller, they have their group. The maize seller, every sector of those commodity of food have unions, subset unions, and they commune. And that's why the price change within a second. Go when they call the chairman of maize seller in Kanu. How much are you selling your bag? Now you say so so amount. You say okay, yeah, we want to sell it less. So I say no, don't sell it less. So transfer that have added money. If you want to add this transfer for added money, price of this have not changed in the last three months. So what is happening? So those are the ways they are the tactics they are using to change price of goods and say that's why you see these days. None of them are mentioning dollar again. They are not talking about dollar. They don't even tell you about this way again. What they are telling you right now, now is that uh, economy ash. Meanwhile, the majority the the, the the, the truck that tra that transports some of these goods use diesel. So the excuse of diesel have failed them. The excuse of dollar has failed them. So what they now use is to use communication to drive the price of goods and services across that, particularly food commodity. And that alone, FCCPC cannot, doesn't have that power to change the price of goods and services unless they, the law that established them is reviewed to give them the power, give them the capacity to do that. If not, they will just continue to engage with Nigerians 
from now to eternity. Now, let's also talk about the dollarization and mm. the strength of our Naira. Mm. In light of this inflationary outlook, headline mm. inflation, 32.15%. Mm. Mm. Food inflation, we're yet to look at it, but it is well still above 40%. Exactly. The challenge now is the strength of our Naira. Mm. Projections were that uh, transportation being the live wire of commerce mm -hmm. with the hike in the price of PMS, we might see a hike going into the festivities that greet the month of December. Mm. In line of all these projections, what's your take on where we're heading mm. in terms of our inflation outlook? I think inflation will continue to, it will continue to show two figures, the reality figures and the official figures. The reality figures is what the one most of us will be confronted as I illustrated through what is happening in the market, how they are using communication to determine the price of goods and services in Nigeria. Then the official one is what the government will be trying as much as to do through their own proactiveness. The NBS will send the official to the market to go and check the price of goods and services and the rest of them. But by the time we enter the market, the price will change. By the time they go to the office, they can use the word they have gotten, but it will be different from what we have. Now, the challenge remains that the economy is having issues. And the issue is because the economy is not productive enough. We are not producing enough to consume. And the government policy is on a two leg prone. One, the government is sourcing for revenue and it's also sourcing for stability. And when you put these two together, you can't work. Because the more revenue you chase through physical policy, through monetary policy, the stability you are trying to maintain, you can't maintain it. Let me break it down. Now, relation to the, uh, the, the Naira falling or the Naira debilitated is this government is sourcing for revenue, two to angle. One, using physical policy, using monetary policy. It wants to raise money through our bonds sellings, treasury paper sellings. You can discover that the 500 million US bond that they asked for, they got over 900 at 9.78% to each of the bonds you are getting. So that's on one way. Now, if you ask me, where would the government get the money to pay all those bond paper? They have to devalue the currency because they have to use the valuation of the currency to defend the Naira against the dollar and against the payment of those treasury bills they are, they are trying to get. That's on one. Then the other angle is it. The fiscal policy of collecting taxes from businessmen, putting more hardship, increasing the price of work, is also part of revenue generation for the government. Now, by the time you push all those things out to the business people, who will they transfer all those things to? They transfer it on the ordinary consumer. So, the monetary rev the revenue that you want to generate to bring stability will not bring any stability. Rather, the stability will become instability. As a result of what? These two cannot work at the same time. And what we are trying to say is that, in as much as government said to get revenue, they must impose certain fixed charges, certain this and certain that on the businesses. And the other hand, they don't want to go and borrow money directly from anybody. They want to use instrumentality of the fixed income, like selling bonds paper, selling treasury paper to raise more money and push that money to the economy to address some of the challenges they are having. And now paying back that money they are borrowed through the fixed income, the currency have to fall for it. And that's what is happening. You can discover that last week, CBN sold uh, uh, one, each one one dollar to BDC at one thousand five hundred and forty eight naira, and they must not sell beyond one thousand five hundred and uh, eighty eight naira because at this, as we speak right now, a BDC must not make above thirty naira on each dollar they are selling. But guess what? They will make more more than that because they will use a third party to be selling. Now, do you think I missed a call for mm. many economics, much like yourself, to the Apex Bank, the mm. CBN, to reduce the interest rate to say? They're about 37.52%. Do you think that the leadership of the CBN through its governor, Louis Emi Cardoso, mm. would listen to such calls? They have been listening, but they will never listen and take that advice because they also look at bigger picture. I, what is the bigger picture? U.S. foreign reserve. Last week, the U.S. Uh, inflation dropped a little less than uh, 5%. You get it. But it, it, it did not affect the the, the ordinary market in the U.S. and also the the, the the rate, the interest rate is still very high, although not double figures like our own. Because one thing about central bank across the world, particularly in third world countries, is that anytime you see them acting, the way they are acting, they are not just just going to act that way. You know? They look at what is the rate in U.S. What is the European bank put, uh, putting at their rate? The real essence is because higher rate, interest rate particularly attract investors. Because it's just those of us that are complaining that uh, uh, they are putting interest rate also have a good, good side. It has positive side. Like the, the, the 500 million US dollar bond that the government put out now. If it's not for the interest rate that is very high, nobody will come and 
although it's a domestic one. Nobody come and pick that inter, uh, the, uh, uh, 500 billion US uh, bond at 9.8 percent. But because it's high, and that was dictated as a result of the what CBN have already fixed for his own interest rate. So interest rate has his own advantage for fixed income earners, for stock brokers, for people dealing with stock in the stock market. But on the other way, and for small businesses and large businesses who want to go and borrow money from who only credit facility, it's going to be very difficult for them. Those are the disadvantages of interest rate. But on the other side, you also have his own advantage. But they will not listen to reducing interest. Rate. Although Kaidoso have promised that he's going to look at that soon. But I don't see him taking that advantage. Because as you speak right now, a lot of treasury paper, a lot of government paper is going out. And the only thing that can attract people to buy government paper is what? Interest rate. Well, interesting conversations this morning following the publication by the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS. Now, NBS says using the Consumer Price Index, a measurement of a change in the rate of good prices and commodities in the markets, published that as of the month of August, the inflationary rate dropped to 32.15%. Now, measuring that on a year-on-year -year basis, what it means is that headline inflation is still... Uh, slightly increased by 6.52 percent because as of august last year 2023 at this time the nbs published that inflation stood at 25.82 percent now this is strong indications in terms of what food prices and commodity prices would be sold out in the market now in reflection of this uh, mr de Folaring has called on the cbn to also reduce the interest rates to make it better for Nigerians at this point. Now, moving forward, but still on this issue, is also a key Nigerian who is currently the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Uiwela, who says she has unfinished business at the WTO and is bidding for a second term. Now, let's get perspectives on what this second term might imply in terms of uh, the World Trade Organization and in the Nigerian interest of how significant a second term for Dr. Ngozi Nwonjo Wela would pretend for Nigeria. Hmm. I, I think it's one of those uh, positions that you know, Africans have never just took for the WTO because historically, the WTO before the WTO came, the WTO was very a uh, general agreement on the trade and tariff. And uh, at that point, when it was got, it was recorded as one of the unjust international organizations that was done badly with West Africa because what got then, and what the WTO represents today is that it determines the price of commodities, particularly raw materials that have been exported or exported from Africa. So, initially, most critical economists do not even like to hear anything about WTO or GATT. But recent, a uh, lot of people are paying attention to them because of the new uh, means of entry. In a sense that before now, no African person has occupied that, uh, that particular position, and no third world individual has occupied that position. We could all have to break the genes. Although that's where that's not where she wanted to be, she wanted to be in the World Bank, but because she didn't get the World Bank, and you know those two, World Bank and IMF is being shared between America and Europe, but of a of a particular time, not changing the dynamics by allowing Asian to also occupy that position, but they always have that interest because IMF and World Bank, I, 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 World Bank is controlled by the US, IMF is controlled by the by the European countries, but WTO is controlled by both. A continent that means Europe and uh, America, but they now let go that let the WTO go to uh, a sub Saharan African person. And Koji Ola was able to take that position. But upon that, a lot of people are not yet convinced, critical economists are not yet convinced because the reason to be done has not been done. Because the injustice in terms of price determination of commodity, I WTO have not addressed that particular issue until today. They have not addressed it. Maybe if Madam Koji Ola win that second time, she may be able to be critically do that. Because a lot of third world African countries are crying out that till tomorrow, the price of their commodity, no matter what that commodity is, once you are exporting it out of your shore, the price is not determined by you. The price is determined by the buyer. And majority European countries and American countries. So that needs to be corrected. And those are the injustices that majority of us cry out against WTO. But I hope she can do it because in her first time, there was reform in WTO. WTO begin to take in, into cognizance the issue of gender perspective in businesses and the rest of them although that's not what their core line of duty or mandate as wto but they begin to make entry or entryism into areas that are a little bit of humanitarian just like the way world bank and imf also 
you know, reform themselves and bring it to undo areas that, that are more social and economic welfare of countries. WTO also begin to take that into that's why you see them going to entrepreneurship, teaching, tech skills, and the rest of that is not their mandate. Their mandate is to see how they can safeguard international pricing of commodities. But as she said, she wants to take the second time. We wish her the best, but the challenge is still there. The entire control of WTO is not in her hands as a person, not even in the hands of her team. It's in the hands of the US and the America. But we just we want to wish her the best. And wish her the best that when she takes the second time, she can be able to advance uh, the critical aspect of what third world countries are asking for the WTO to do. That may reform the entire international trading system that are being of disadvantage to third world countries. Because if she doesn't do that, she wins the second term and she finish. The problem remains and you know many third world countries will still be disappointed because WTO have not really answered the question of how to adjust and readjust and address the problem of the uh, gaps between how we make our price known, how we advise the price and pushing for a price that will be more stable for African countries. Now, there's another issue in the news. Mm. The federal government is looking to exploit the $7 trillion mm. HALA global market mm. with projections that uh, we can target a $1.5 billion GDP via the strategic initiatives by the year 2027. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts on this project? It's, quite, it's, a, it's, a low, it's an ambitious target. But we have to look at the disadvantage of this uh, fixed income kind of uh, generating revenue for the country. They have their own long-term disadvantage and it's on the currency because all these issues that okay we are running away from collecting direct tax uh, rev money from world bank or imf we are running to the one that is a little bit short term in the look uh, more flexible they have their own problem on the currency i just made mention of the the 500 mil, uh, billion uh, they just got in from a, a domestic bond of dollar the problem will be that the currency will pay for it because they don't have any other choice so the allah target good but how are we going to sustain that the currency will not be devalued more because that's where we have to point out although mainstream economists will not make mention of this but those of us that are critical economists we have to tell the government the fact good go for the ala but how are you going to sustain it the how is the currency will fare after you have gone for all this big fixed income uh, uh, money that you are going for on the international scene uh, and lastly, another economic outlook which is captured on our last paper for review this morning. Above the masthead, where we're looking to discuss the Edo Guba elections. But before we get into the Edo Guba elections, you'd find inserted on the New Telegraph, above that lead story to the left hand corner, a picture of the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wale Edo. The caption is H1 2024. Digital financial expansion boosts VAT by 60% to 148.18 billion naira. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, you know, conversations around VAT have become even more interesting. Because the government is taxing everything on the internet. That's what it means. Let's just make it plain to the people. There's nothing uh, sophisticated, there's nothing superficial about the digital economy. It's about trading, it's about buying and selling. That's what digital economy is all about. So, whatever you are buying, whatever you are selling, the VAT has come to play a role to collect 7.5% from what you are buying and what you are selling. Simple. So government is making more money. So whatever billions they are making, what Nigerians will not be asking for is that as we make that money, let us see it in infrastructure. Let us see it evidently in things that Nigerians can say, okay, thumb up for the government, money will be made and they'll put it in this, in that and that. That's all. So because people will think that digital economy is one kind uh, you know, one kind of divinity kind of there's nothing superficial about it. It's just buying and selling. And government have put a tax of 7.5% on what you are doing, what you are offering, what you are selling. So the money is coming to the government and they're making more money. Simple. Now, our last major issue in the news on the local scene this morning is the Edo gubernatorial election scheduled for the 21st of September 2024, that is this Saturday. Earlier on the headlines on the New Telegraph, we saw comments by the Christian cleric Bishop Kuka, who likened the situation with the PDP refusing to sign the peace accord in Edo State to what happened in Lagos when uh, President Bola Metinibu was then running for the governorship position in Lagos, saying that the committee cannot force PDP at this moment. There's also been an interesting twist to it, as a lawsuit has been filed by Godalo 
against former Governor Godwin of uh, Governor Adam Soshomole, now Senator Adam Soshomole. Now, a 20 billion naira lawsuit has been slammed on him in what is called the defamatory comments on Planwell. Hmm. Well, there's a lot happening in Edo State. Let's pick these issues one after the other. Mm. Let's start with this comment by Bishop Kuka at this moment. I, I, I think I watched that uh, signing or called by all the political parties, 17 of them in Edo, and I saw the drama that PDP put up. You know, before then, the day before then, I think I was in the studio and uh, Governor Basque said they are not going to sign it. And we all said that it's not by force to sign it. Don't even send representatives there. But all of a sudden, we saw PDP representatives there. They marched to the stage to the stage of the signing and they told Bishop Kuka that they're not going to sign the man. The okay. stage, stage, they walk out. They, and they walk out. And later they came back and they wanted to give the man a, a something like a protest letter. And the man said, no, 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 this is not the place to collect such things. And they left. So nobody is forcing anybody to sign anything. And but, but in terms of the significance, mm -hmm. do you think it is just ceremonial mm -hmm. that despite signing peace accords over the past elections, there were still reported incidents of violence and voter intimidation. Mm. Do you think that should the PDP have signed it, the people of Edo State might have, you know, been more assured that there will be less issues of voter intimidation or mm. election day violence? No, that can you can't hold that out. Those character of the Nigerian election will also exhibit themselves. Voter intimidation, arrest, uh, 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 intimidation, and all those violence will always occur in election, no matter how peaceful any election is. Although it may not be too wide, but definitely to happen. Voter by vote buying will also take place, but the significance of that that ceremony is just to put the consciousness on the political leadership. But the people that were perpetrate this act of electoral violence, they, they are not the ones that put their pen their, their pen on paper to sign. So nobody will, will go and chase them, and that's why it's very difficult to prosecute election violence in Nigeria because the perpetrator you can't get them. Now the the leadership that signed. They know that they can be arrested. So none of them will go and carry gun. None of them will go and establish any voting point. But the people they will use, and that's where the problem. If you listen to the speech of the chairman of the commission, um, uh, retired general, Mr. Salam, he said something. He said, people need to be conscientized. And that conscientization must go beyond the platform to the, to the floor. Meaning that the people who are going to follow PDP, APC, Labour Party to the election ground, they must be conscientized that there should be no violence. But do they take this message to the, to, to the people? And sometimes when you see politicians acting the way they are acting, know that the body language or the sign language of what they are saying to their member is that be alert. Simple, be alert. All the other political parties that sign, it could be a sign to their members that be ready, there is no violence. But the one that refused to sign, what message is he passing to his members? But it's also ceremonial because in the past, all manner of signing have been done in the past and nobody really acted because there is no much sanction on political election violence in Nigeria, or violators in Nigeria. But with the message you need to pass, electoral election need to be peaceful. And the handwriting must be on the wall that it has to be peaceful. All this intrigue that you are seeing by politicians, is just to cause confusion in, in the election. But we know that the voters are ready to vote for who they want to vote and cast their vote as expected. Now, this lawsuit has slammed mm. by Igodalo on Senator Oshomole, 20 billionaire over diplomatic comments. Now, a lot of comments have been made in the build-up to this election, even to a point of targeting families. Mm. That barring whole barring statements mm -hmm. and all that. I, I don't know if it's part of the political gimmicks like you're saying, mm -hmm. but, but in times like this, one would think that the campaign should be issue-based. Mm. What do you make of this development? It's because both parties don't have anything to tell the voters. And that's why they will look for one comedy, one comic statement to make and make the people to be excited. Although you have been to political right. uh, rally before, you hear what politicians, they don't have anything to say. We'll give you water, we'll give you life. Those are old stories. Now when it's government that people don't want to listen to, we'll give you water, we'll give you light again. They twist it and begin to make it a comedy scene. And that's why the lines of Shumole can go and say whatever I want to say. Even the PDP people, they are not also excused from it. They also say their own thing. Now, either you are issuing, giving, uh, sending somebody to court on uh, whatever, they can also do the same thing. It's just the political gimmick, the interest that comes within our political party or politi party policy because the politicians don't have anything to offer on both sides. Either the ruling go government in Edo State or the ones that are trying to take the position, all of them don't have anything to offer. In the past 16 or 25 years of uh, electoral democracy, you go and check what has happened in Edo State. Who are ruled there? What have they done so far for Edo people? That's the question we should be asking. So far, as far as I'm concerned, they don't have anything to offer. That's why they turn into a comedy show by harassing and intimidating family 
by saying what they want to say, which is more like a comedy show that we normally have in comedy centers. Now, now this system of democracy that we've borrowed from the Western mm. world and we look to replicate in the Nigerian contest, we, we've seen most of them stage debates. Exactly. We focus our campaigns mostly mm. on rallies. Mm. Do you think that the Nigerian state needs to evolve, even at the state level or even at the federal level, mm. to begin to imbibe this culture of having issue-based campaigns and debates where candidates will be engaged on the quanti on the content of their manifestos mm. and the plan, so that even if they're elected into office, we can refer to statements made during the debates or even in ruling out that manifesto that this mm. was what was promised mm. on the agenda of a party and the candidates at hand, and this is a roadmap as to if they are on track, mm. more like an indices to measure how well a government is performing. It's expected to do that, but are the politicians ready to give that to the people? Because one thing you must know about Nigerian politicians, they have been able to understand the psychology of every voter. They know that every voter is poor, every voter is looking for one tips, right now, 1,000. So, so you feel it's like a deliberate effort to weaponize hunger? They have done that, and they will continue to do that, unless the people do the necessary. And what the people do the necessary means that they must look beyond the current area of politicians that we have. In, in looking beyond, do you think this limitation is based on the literacy level? Because like you've said, if hunger has been weaponized, a lot of persons are not probably as sound to read mm -hmm. these economic indices like you have mm -hmm. done, or look at the beyond the party and look at the candidate mm -hmm. in terms of his antecedents in other either appointed or elected mm -hmm. positions to say that based on antecedents and precedents, this person has what it takes to pull either my community at the world exactly. level or even the state out of where it is currently. The problem is the structure that the system is, is operating. As it stands right now, the party, party politics that we are playing does not give room for that question to be asked. All the people that you see in most political gatherings are members of the political party from their world level. Who are only interested to come and collect their own shares. But the real voters that they're supposed to educate and give the necessary information, they will not be there because they are afraid of violence. So that one created alone will keep them away. But the, what they are looking for is the smallest of all that puts certain things in place and let us have the prosperity of the state shared across board. But that will not be done because of the structure and the system that we are operating. But we just hope that the do election will give us a better room whereby the right candidates will be elected. Not from the popular party, because what we have is that the popular party definitely, when, if any of them win, the, team, the, the problem that they have will continue. But when a popular person comes in, that being voted for by the people, the people may, he may listen to the people because he knows that he was voted by the people. Not because his godfather is somewhere, or his political party has the money, or his political party is very popular. But the problem is that because of the current situation, and as you speak, right, it's just three parties that is making the noise in the door. But we have that fine. A gentleman who are contesting on that unpopular political party. Who could do the magic? But would they have the time? Would they also have the chance? Do they have the resources to distribute the other party will do? They don't have it. And those are people that have the genuine art to do things for their people. But they will not have the chance to be elected. So we just hope that, but as I said earlier, if the people are ready, they will pick their candidate. Not minding where that person comes from, but believing that the mandate that person has promised them, the, the manifesto that I have shown to them, is what you will work on. Not that the one that we're working from from national level as I've seen in the past. Now in closing, in terms of the preparedness, one on the part of INEC mm -hmm. and on the part of the security architecture in Edo State, the CUPP are calling for the redeployment of the resident electoral commissioner deployed to the state and also the police commissioner as well. Uh, are these calls genuine? Uh, what can be done four days to an election in terms of what the CUPP is saying? These are the usual noise normally here from people who are interested in the election like this. You ask me, they have, these are the same noise we will be hearing anytime election comes. But we know that ANEC have done their best. For me, either they remove the CP, either they remove the uh, ANEC uh, Resident Electoral Commission, whatever any political party wants to do, they will still do it. It's not a matter of removing anybody. But the thing is that let voters be allowed to vote. Either you remove the man or you don't remove the man, voters will still vote and their vote will count or let their vote count as expected. So see you people as always be that pressure group that normally speak. And because they are biased, and that's why people like us will never even support what they are saying, because they're always biased. It was led by a, a, a Kenga. He used that same pressure, that same propaganda to get himself into the National Assembly. And he's enjoying it, 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 whatever, it, because they use propaganda to push themselves out in, into the mainstream of Nigerian politics. And that's what they want to do.
But for Nigerians, for those voters, go and do your vote. Even like let them remove the CP today, remove the resident election committee, whatever political party want to do, they will still do it. That won't stop them. But the key issue is that let us vote peacefully in Edo on Saturday. That is the message they should be preaching, not asking for CP to go or resident election commission to be removed. Well, we must thank you for your time on the program this morning. Thanks I believe so. your last statement is a good place to leave it. Mm.